has been working on uh, Aapte of the past year has been working on uh, the question of what is digital public infrastructure on the one hand, and also how is digital public infrastructure being used in different contexts? And hi, uh, how is digital public infrastructure being used in different contexts? And often these conversations around digital public infrastructure or digital public goods is overtly concerned with the technical components of uh, of DPGs and DPI, right? And we see that as a core problem statement itself. Because just as we try to figure out the technicalities of how to roll out these complex systems, it's just as important to consider uh, how you build uh, the non-technical components around it. So we see the non-technical layers, so to speak, having three elements to it. And the first element is communities. And that's what we'll be discussing today. And this is more than just the community of developers who help build a digital public infrastructure or good. We see the community involving broader actors who help integrate that particular system in the context, but also who, you know, uh, contextualize it for a country or its particular geography's requirements. So there is, in essence, something called a community of practice that exists around uh, a digital public good. And we see that happening with DHIS. Very, there's a vibrant community around of practice around it. And the other non-technical layers that Aapti is studying, but we will probably not be discussing too much of it today, but happy to, given that this is a rather small audience, uh, is governance of digital public goods and infrastructure. So given that a lot of digital public goods and infrastructure mediate access to essential services. In the case of DH DHIS, it's health, but in several cases, you have ID systems that tell you whether you're eligible for food stamps or that tell you whether you're eligible for admission in a hospital or things like that, right? So those are essential services that digital public goods do mediate. So can we roll them out without considering how does it impact people's lives and their rights is also something that we want to understand from the governance perspective. And the third non-technical layer is how do you finance these digital public infrastructure and goods? What does sustainability look like? Can countries continue relying on donor support from around the world to build their digital public infrastructure and goods? Should there be more long be a more long-term vision to how you think about digital public infrastructure. So uh, that's the third component of the non-technical layer that we're seeing. And specifically not narrowing in on the question of communities in the context of digital public goods, um, I want to take a step back and say, what are digital public goods, right? We have seen and we've lived with digital public goods uh, as a part of our everyday life longer than the term itself has existed. So DHIS is an example of a digital public good that has been in existence for over two decades now. But then there are newer uh, DPGs that have come to the forefront. Uh, you have something called a modular open source identity program or MOSIP. That is a DPG that helps countries build their own ID systems. And you see some of it being uh, you know, rolled out in different phases uh, across countries like Ethiopia, Sri Lanka, Morocco, and so on. So that's another example. There's also something very interesting called Primero, right? And Primero is a platform that helps you track instances of gender-based violence and child sexual abuse. And that is also a DPG. And what unites a lot of DPGs is their connection to something called SDGs and DPGs can help accelerate progress towards certain SDGs. Primero, for instance, is linked to accelerating progress towards SDG 5, which is gender equality. DHIS 2 is linked to accelerating progress towards SDG 3, which is health for all. And MOSIP, the other example that I mentioned, is related to SDG 9, which is industry and innovation. So all SDGs, are, I mean, all DPGs are 
united in their ability to accelerate progress towards SDGs. And yesterday's presentation by Leave uh, was also rather interesting because Leave is the head of what is now called the Digital Public Goods Alliance. It's a standard setting authority in this space. Uh, they provide uh, you know, guidance on what is a DPG and what is not and so on. And why did we discuss these three examples? Because DHIS2 is very different from MOSIP, is very different from Primero. Primero continues to remain an open source tool, but it's developed internally by Primero itself. There is no countrywide or nationwide uh, systems or communities that help build Primero. While DHIS, on the other hand, DHIS2 is rather interesting because the core remains in Oslo, while each country has its own iteration of that particular effort. And the reason why DHIS is a lot more robust and resilient is communities, we'd like to believe. And why are communities important? From, from several levels, right? They help make a DPG sustainable. They help make DPG adaptable to a particular context. They also make DPGs relevant for longer than in the short term, which is why you can have DHIS being used not only for health, but also for different sectors. And uh, there are some technical stipulations of what is a DPG. The DPGA speaks about it at length. Uh, I will just mention them briefly, basically open standards, open protocols, open AI uh, are all different components. Open source software in general are all different components of what becomes a DPG. And uh, in our study on communities around digital public infrastructure, what we wanted to understand is now that DHIS2 has successfully built several communities of practice around itself, how can other new and emerging digital public goods also aim to do that? And uh, we are particularly interested in this question because in India, you have a lot of DPG communities we are working with two of them. One of them is called eGovernments Foundation, Foundation, and the other is uh, the Foundation for Interoperable and uh, Digital Economy. And the eGov Foundation has built something called the Digit Platform, which is a urban governance DPG, while the uh, Foundation for Interoperable uh, and Digital Economy has built something called the Beckon Protocol, which has, in fact, led uh, to the creation of a very unique platform called Namayatri. And Namayatri in, aims to like address problems posed by platforms like Uber. They want drivers to be empowered uh, without having to pay commissions to third parties like Uber. But both Namayatri and eGov have not been able to scale because they don't have communities around it. They want to learn how to build communities to take Namayatri and Digit to other geographies. So we are engaging with them in their journey of building communities. But in engaging with them, we also want to learn from legacy open source communities. And the legacy open source communities, my colleague led several of these conversations. We've spoken to people from Linux, from Apache, from the DHIS2 community, and beyond to understand how their own journeys and evolutions look like. Uh, I will pause here and ask if there's any questions before we jump right in uh, to the other uh, questions that we have set for discussion. Uh, I will also warn that this, uh, at, you know, current session is going to be less uh, presentation heavy. This is where the presentation ends. The rest of it is more discussions. We have questions for you. Uh, we will use the time to discuss and seeing as we're not too many people, we could probably move closer and uh, you know, make it uh, more intimate and uh, cozy for all of us. Having said that, uh, does anybody have questions on what I've mentioned so far or on the work Apti does, anything in general, even online? Yes. Could you please introduce yourself? Yes. And also your favorite dessert, that's a missing <laughs> <laughs> so hi, uh, thank you for this presentation. I'm Hanin Saad, the access to implementation specialist. Uh, I'm working in the University of Oslo in the health center. So uh, I'm sorry, I I didn't been here in, from the first, but uh, you mentioned uh, one of the 
DPG is the gender-based violence. Did you implement the anything that is related to this uh, thing? And uh, if you can please talk more about the privacy of data. If you want to take this, you spoke to Primero. Okay. We spoke to Primero from the lens of understanding, you know, whether they have a community around it. So we spoke to several, like, as uh, my colleague mentioned that we did the learn part of it. So our, our interactions were solely focused on understanding what they do, but more than what they do, kind whether they have like an active community around it. In terms of the work that they do, I think we more like, we, I would say that, uh, as Saoj mentioned, they do a lot of work on gender-based violence and instances of that. But in terms of whether they have a community or not, uh, they do not. And the reason of the reason as to why they feel that they don't have a community, and it's also we also ask them if that is something that they want to look into in the in the next coming years. And to that, their answer was no. And that's because they have a safety net, which is UNICEF. Uh, so in the case of Primero, we see that there is enough funding for them. So from the lens of sustainability of Primero itself, they feel that, uh, you know, the uh, the DPG will continue to be or like will continue to sustain given that they have the required funding. But unfortunately, they don't see the need for the community uh, in the next few years given that they have that safety net. Uh, so for them, community has never been a priority. Uh, so for us, why we still continued to, you know, uh, speak to Primero and gain insights from them is we want to see through the research that despite having funding, do you still have a case for building a community, right? So that's the question we want to kind of build and uh, kind of unpack through the research uh, is that, you know, like, if you don't have funding, then uh, like, do we go into building a community only when your funding dries out? Or do we also look at other, you know, reasons or make the case to DPGs that, you know, irrespective of whether you have enough funding or not, you should still be looking at uh, building a community. And to that, our answer is yes. Because the reason is you may have the required funding, but somewhere down the line, when you're looking at global adoption, and if you're looking at building context specific solutions, we believe that even for a DPG like Primero, as they expand and as they begin to like look into, you know, building out their use cases uh, into like child specific gender based violence across countries, they will be requiring a community which kind of acts like field sensors for them because. I presume in, especially in cases related to child sexual abuse and gender-based violence, it's very context specific. So you need to have a community that acts as, you know, field sensors. Um, however, for them, that's not something that they're looking at. But nevertheless, it was very interesting for us to speak to them uh, because it kind of changed our perspective during the course of our research, wherein we decided to, you know, like understand that, okay, then, you know, why do we need a community even if you have funding, like we kind of want to make the case for that as well. Thank you. Yeah. And to specifically answer your question about uh, data privacy, I believe even though the platform is open by, uh, you know, nature in terms of like how it is used and integrated, uh, the data being able to access on the back end is protected by some, some sort of uh, role-based control access. You need some keys and some, there is some level of uh, encryption, but not probably the most uh, sophisticated because of the context it works in. And uh, it was also recently rolled out in South Sudan, uh, where rates of GBV are quite high. So they consider it privately as one of the big success stories that, um, you know, they could roll out. But having said that, Primero is still a very small, uh, you know, platform in that it's instantiated in only about less than 50 countries. So, I mean, it's small only because in the larger sense of the world, it's one third of country, one fourth of countries, right? But I hope that answers your question. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Any questions? Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, we'll jump right into the discussion. Uh, so all of you are 
part of the DHIS community in different capacities, have used DHIS for different reasons, are either studying about it or are actively involved in its implementation, integration, uh, in its contextualization, and so on. And in your experience, what has been, uh, you know, your own role in in this DHIS ecosystem? Uh, and and if you ever ran into a problem, who is that you approached, right? And the third question I would ask is, has that in any way uh, made you reflect on the broader DHIS community itself? Uh, if yes, how do you think this community has been useful to you? Uh, yeah, just, just feel free to jump in, raise your hand. I can pass the uh, you know, mic around. Anybody? Oh, so okay. So I was like, all of you have been part of the DHIS ecosystem in different capacities, right? You're studying about it, but then there might be uh, country implementers who have been implementing it. And then there are others who use it from a tracking and monitoring perspective as, uh, you know, third party users of the platform. So uh, how has been your experience of using it or studying about this is one part, but also in using it, if you had a problem, who would you go to and why? And has that taught you anything about a, having a broader DHIS community? I believe he wants to speak. Can we start off with yeah, him? I, I, I don't know. Do you want to go ahead now? I think I can start. Yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, everyone is eating boxes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, that's a very, very uh, big question. I'm not sure I'm able to answer all of that. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll begin from from somewhere. Uh, so I first uh, began, so my name is Vetla, I'm uh, the PhD student uh, guy. Uh, I first started studying DHS2 in my master's studies, uh, and I looked at how the DHS2 was used for innovation during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I've actually talked to Pamud here a lot, you know, because uh, uh, and and I studied his his work uh, from Sri Lanka uh, about how uh, the um, the system has sort of facilitated innovation locally and um, and also how uh, local innovations can spread and be useful for for more than just um, the ones who sort of started the innovation. Um, so from there, there's so many things to talk about, but I think um, I think one thing which uh, I've learned from studying the HS2 as public good, I think <clears throat> one of the sort of the ways it enacts being a public good is by uh, enabling um, or offering a general purpose technology which is not a solution to anything specific. And that sounds weird, but I think the, my, my point is that, um, and which is also a critique to the DPG Alliance, uh, I don't think that the value of DPGs are in the way they provide solutions specifically. Um, we at the, the the research group over here, we and uh, so not me, but other researchers have, has looked at at this this uh, this concept of uh, solution versus options, and and what the DHS two is really good at is providing options for innovation or um, options for customizing or uh, you know adapting the solution to the local needs. So there is. Uh, so how does DHS do do that? They do it in the design, in the architecture, the technology part. It's very generic. It's not made for. Uh, it's not uh, ready-made solutions, ready to be uh, you know just downloaded. It has to be implemented. It has to be adapted. And it's made for that. Uh, it has many mechanisms for being customized. One thing is the open source part, you know, you can directly do changes in the code and so on, or you can uh, make more like uh, configurations in the, in the interface. So there's many layers of customizability, which enables that. 
you know local uh, fit uh, uh, yeah and then then there is the uh, the sort of uh, uh, social social part of it uh, that was so talking about communities I think um, I think you know the success you know, we have always talked about that the success of DHS2 is not the technology. Google can make a better version tomorrow if they want to, you know. But what Google doesn't have is the community around it and the, all the people engaged in trying to make it better. Um, so, so in so in the work I've done, uh, I've seen that you know um, examples of how use meaning implementing specific solutions can be shared also through mechanisms in the community. So that can be, you know, uh, the, through like forums and Slack channels and, you know, basic communication platforms, but also collaboration with the DHS2 core development. They have a really, I think, a good overview of what most countries want in, the, in sort of a general... Um, let uh, they have the general overview and when they you know uh, in the case of the contact tracing stuff and so on they could see that this was a need everywhere and uh, and um, you know uh, hypothetically Sri Lanka didn't have to share anything uh, they could have just you know made something from themselves and and just uh, you know be isolated but still, there was this uh, social value thing or something. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, willingness to share, willingness to, you know, uh, we can share our meta metadata, our configurations, apps, whatever. And not only Sri Lanka, but many other countries did that in many other use cases. Um, so, well, I don't know what that is, uh, but uh, there's really good people, <laughs> I think, uh, willing to, to share, and, and that's what makes it a DPG, I think. Yeah. So that's a long answer, but uh, yeah, I hope that was good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. This is Mina Negi, Technical Assistant, WHO uh, the Mediterranean Regional Office. Uh, actually, I'm working on health system uh, unit. I'm responsible you have to for your favorite dessert because that's the rule in this workshop. What, my favorite what? Dessert. Favorite dessert. Sweet item. Uh, I believe the the cake today. The spice cake. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, actually, I'm working as a regional data collection uh, for data collector for uh, the data in our region. Uh, I'm using DHIS. I'm newly started using it uh, two years ago. Uh, unfortunately, when I joined WHO, especially this uh, unit, Health Information System Unit, uh, there was no one uh, working with DHIS available at this time. All this, all uh, the old people was already left. So uh, I tried to to learn DHIS on my own. Uh, went through uh, the fundamentals and uh, the, the the available courses online. Uh, I found it very useful. Started to uh, to use it to, to design it. Uh, later on, I faced uh, some problems. Uh, my supervisor introduced me to Sawarabu, who who helped me uh to 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 solve some bugs and issues i faced uh later on uh, i need to stress on uh, what my colleague here said the community of dhis people and his people is started to be uh something is powerful for dhis not the dhis itself the community of dhis people more powerful than the, the application itself and the platform itself because later on i started to found uh, ismail and uh, other uh, colleagues from uh, afro uh, hisps and later i met abdul rahman and hanin uh, speaking arabic for our region so this facilitate our group facilitate even thinking how we can develop our uh, a, a platform, how we can uh, produce a, a, a real uh, a high quality outcome from this application, uh, sharing experience, listening to others, 
يعني uh, we were uh, listening for a few uh, minutes ago for a Palestinian uh, yeah, experience in DHIS and implementing it in the country. It was very interesting for me, interesting for me, and I found that it's very good to un and why not we are not implementing this and uh, empowering these people, especially it's open, uh, easy. Uh, people are uh, available now to you can reach them anytime anywhere and they can he help and support you really uh, not by name and even when I came this first time for me to in Oslo I, I found that people are happy to support happy, happy to share knowledge happy to share experience happy to share problems happy to share uh, everything with you so you are you are getting a, a, a wonderful uh, feedback while you are getting back to your uh, position or country or whatever. Uh, this is very uh, uh, impressive for me. Thanks to the DHIS people, thanks to Oslo people, thanks to all the HESP people uh, who are supporting us everywhere and anytime. Anybody else wants to speak? Okay, so so uh, once again, I want to add for what others say. I want to focus more on the community of practice. So I started working in DHS in 2019. I was then uh, one of the Palestinian team in Palestine. I worked five years for the WHO office there. So my main role was to build and develop uh, many use cases in DHS too. So I remember at the beginning, so as anyone else, you're still a beginner, you face many challenges. So the first, uh, the first approach for me uh, and uh, the, the quick one to get an answer is the community. So in the community, you don't have only like the experts from UIO or for, from HESPs like Pamud and others. So uh, you can find other people that are expert in DHS too, but are located in countries, maybe in Ministry of Health, maybe in WHO offices. So for example, I have my colleagues and me myself before I started here. If uh, for example, I'm in the community and I find for example, uh, any problem that I faced before and related to my work, I would be more than happy to help and to answer. And I, uh, for me also, if I want to uh, learn anything in you, uh, that maybe I get a challenge at, uh, I want to mention like some situation happened to me, I've been asked to do a custom working list. So if anyone knows what is custom working list in DHS2, it's, it's basically a custom list that you cannot configure from the interface. It has to be using APIs and uh, um, maybe uh, third party uh, tools. So I didn't know how to use it, but uh, I went to, I searched through community. I found that there was, there were, others around uh, the countries around the world that, that are asking the same questions. So I contributed to their questions and I asked more and someone actually helped me. He guided me to somewhere in the documentation because you know, we have a lot of, com a lot of documentation uh, in the DHS2 uh, website, but uh, sometimes you need someone to guide you just to put you on the first step. So he only give me like, he sent me like a term to search on. So I searched on this term and finally I found what I was looking for. So then I started to learn more and more through the community and I followed like these issues that are related. And I could finally after uh, two weeks to finally generate my own, my own custom working list. So I think, uh, DHS to community of practice is a very successful story. It keep growing up day after day, and we have many experts around the many regions: Imro, Afro, um, India, Africa, uh, the, from University of Oslo. So we have a lot of experts that are ready to uh, to help. So 
and maybe um, this is what made uh, DHS2 uh, a success um, story itself. And yeah, I advise like other platforms to have like the same community, the same, maybe this sharing knowledge between uh, individuals, not only the experts, and in community, you you can find you can find like the basic questions and the advanced one. Yeah, there is no specific topic. You can ask whatever you want. And uh, the beauty in uh, the uh, in the community practice that it's uh, categorized based on uh, different topics. So you will find Android. You will find implementation. You will find budgeting and planning. So a lot of things happening there. I do recommend everyone to go there and just to have an overview overview of this uh, great uh, community. Thank you. Oh, who wants to go? There you go. Thank you. Um, a slightly different perspective from someone who isn't really a user of DHS2 yet. Um, but I think one of the things that I'm uh, is interesting is around the kind of just the, and maybe more on the topic is just because it's a digital public. Oh, sorry, my name's Liz Tideswell. I'm a, a work for Sight Savers, uh, which is a global charity working in um, uh, education, healthcare. Um, so um, I was just contemplating the difference between something which is a public good, but something which is also commercial and has a kind of financial impact or uh, financial implications so there is there is a financial element to using and being part of the dhs community but perhaps it's different to the example that you gave earlier in that there isn't a single source of funding for everything that's happening probably most people are using dhs2 um through funding from lots and lots of different sources whether it's different you know global organizations different academic things and maybe that has an influence on the kind of community of practice side of things and also from a kind of academic background having its roots in a university situation creates a kind of rolling academic element to it so PhD students who start within the kind of community have a an a kind of approach to learning which lends itself I think to a community of practice which perhaps doesn't if a if an organization doesn't sit in an academic setting maybe you don't have that um, kind of rolling community. You don't have that rolling education. You don't have the courses that relate to it in university settings. So yeah, that from some observations from a very uh, short career involving DHS2 so far. And that's also a very bad noteworthy, uh, you know, insight, mostly because even in our research at Aapti about communities around DPGs, one of the things we realized is DHIS does benefit necessarily from having an institutional academic partner, which in some case, MOSIP, the modular open source identity program also does benefit from, but unfortunately, they decided not to go the academic route. They decided to outsource uh, code development to a third party. And so that's why there is absolutely no community around it. It's just a bunch of people sitting outside in a different company altogether who are doing the code. While if the code is open, there's it's still MOSIP who controls the keys to how the code is used and implemented. Uh, having said that, I think Pramod wants to come in. Yeah, I mean, Really good insights from uh, all different types of DHS2 users. So uh, again, I'm uh, Pamod. I'm representing the HISP Center at UIO as well as HISP Sri Lanka. So I have both kind of uh, background here as well, like from the region. So I'm the dessert police here. So <laughs> it's a very difficult question uh, to pick one. So uh, there are like so many different types of ice creams all around the world. That I have tried. So I will uh, stick to that because I get to try different flavors from different regions. Okay, coming back to the core question. Now, the thing about community across DPGs, like, see, why do you need a community? Mm -hmm. So if you just uh, look at it from a very technical as in technological perspective, most of the open source solutions, I wouldn't say DPGs, look at the community as like contributors to the mm -hmm. development code, right? That's, that's the case for most of the open source software. But in DHS2, I'm kind of uh, repeating a few of the ideas I shared yesterday in the um, uh, parallel session. So in DHS2, of course, the developers are included, 
but here the emphasis is also about the people who implement people who conduct research and people who who are donors right and of course marketplace right so that's why i even highlighted this virtual gathering place for dhs2 community of practice which is the uh, the web, i mean portal that we have it has a kind of market opportunities so again i don't believe that uh, like you can always argue a digital public good can it not have any commercial value because like if it is a free and open source solution it doesn't kind of you know like even like if you look at the licensing right if it is something like bsd it doesn't really uh, limit someone from using it for commercial purpose so actually we don't need to go down that line because we if we stick to the question so the main thing about dhs2 community and or like like community in general what we need to kind of delineate is like this community is for who and most of the dpgs will only consider and look at it from a very technical perspective yeah and will only include developers but here this particular digital public good uh, has a larger uh, a representation in the community that is one and then let's try to compare it of course with like let's uh, say dpg we can compare it dpg versus non dpg without doing that let's uh, uh, think about fos free and open source versus yeah. proprietary right so uh butler asked the question like yeah why did sri lanka shared whatever the metadata and the initial thing during the pandemic i was actually asking in the same question from the director who was from the ministry here like what if they didn't do that yeah but our argument is like the whatever the good that we did to the community would have been much much less if we did not share it like we would have this temporary satisfaction of like okay we were the first we did something <laughs> that's it that's it right nobody else would yeah. use it and like it will i mean whatever that happened not only us like there were so many hits they were sharing and it kind of made life easier for everyone so in i mean again if you compare proprietary and this it's about like if uh, for the for the proprietary software there is a, a designated team who produce the code and you have implementers paid implementers yeah. contractors right so whatever in proprietary system which is done by whoever paid organizations it's done uh, at a kind of a with with a good heart uh, by all these people in the community so that's why dpg should have community again the question you should ask from the dpg producers like what do they perceive by the term community yeah. you will mostly I, i'm 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 assuming now but like based on my experience they will always say our community is a community of developers 100%. again like uh, going back to what i said yesterday because you quoted um, uh, about uh, mosip that they don't want to have like they are a separate entity they didn't want to have it rooted in, uh, academic. in academia like so uh, quoting from my presentation yesterday uh, in 2016 there was this evaluation done by norad which identified because i think dhs2 also had that kind of a dilemma back then whether it should be an independent entity given that there's so much of funding and it's like doing like some specific work but what they found out out was that for dhis2 whatever coming from research and that research is feeding into uh, the core platform yeah is what is driving it and for that to happen it has to be rooted in 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 a university i'm challenging you like can you apply the same for like any other dpg and can you say like you know for this dpg this is not valid it probably like it was their choice i don't think it is not valid it was their choice so uh, i mean i know like you must be having some uh, yeah so I, i'm talking too much but i i just wanted to highlight these two couple of no so i have responses to this but i want you yeah. to come in and then yeah um i will be quick i will just add one barrier or maybe one challenge when uh, building a community is to support multiple languages so uh multiple languages so now uh, i'm um, i'm supporting arabic speaking language uh, countries me and my colleague abed so one thing that we are facing right now is no there is not a lot of resources in arabic in dhs2 that's why university of oslo recruited me and david so this one thing we have to consider when we build a community is is to um to include the the languages of the targeted audience of course english is very perfect but maybe we have some time to think about other languages thank you in addition to english 
English is not common for uh, some people working in MOH in Arabic uh, yeah. countries. So uh, when we have now the Kamal and Hanif, from original view, I can say that we are going to see a, a, a more implementation and more uh, success for DHRS in our uh, uh, Middle East uh, area. So that's why, uh, including all these people uh, having multi languages uh, covering uh, the, the areas with uh, use a different language than English or French, is better than having the, uh, the whole language only. Yeah. And I'll just use this if I. Uh, no, I was just going to quickly reply to what you were saying, uh, which is that language is such a huge part of how people perceive and also like understand a particular platform and experience, right? And uh, in India, we have many platforms uh, and a lot of our services are available online. And one of the services that was made available online was our COVID vaccination service through the COVID platform. And uh, we spoke to some of the people who are involved in uh, the process of, you know, explaining to, uh, it was made compulsory, the government didn't give anybody a choice to use COVID or not, but to explain it to district level officials, the COVID platform developers had to create manuals in so many languages, at least 10 languages, because, and, and the COVID platform itself was initially only available in two languages, which is English, and Hindi, which is the other large language spoken in India. But also Hindi is not a language that the whole of India speaks. My colleague and I barely speak Hindi because we're from the south of India. And so if if my, say, I wanted to use the platform, I could use it in English. But there are people, even my, like, my, my friends or their grandparents or so on are not going to be able to use the a smartphone in English, right? So find one of the things that they had to do very early on in that COVID experience was to make the platform available in local languages and uh, completely on like, like recognize the value in creating context specific resources for different languages. And there's also in fact a problem that uh, I keep going back to this example, which is MOSIP, but that's also because MOSIP is one of those DPGs that's being rolled out at a national scale across countries. And this is being rolled out in Philippines where they speak Spanish and their local languages, but also in Morocco and Ethiopia, two, two countries in the same continent, but different languages again, right? And one of the biggest problems that MOSIP is facing, despite having support from governments, is they don't have anybody in their own internal teams to be able to, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, they don't have anybody in their own internal teams to be able to help officials make sense of the platform in their own languages, which is why MOSIP has now invested and is thinking about creating a community of practice around. Uh... Sir, you want to come in? Power? This investment, uh, not uh, investment, uh, improving, improving uh, a platform or uh, developing a, a platform, not only on uh, coding or uh, designing the yeah. platform. You have to invest on also on soft uh, skills of people who are working on precisely. This. Yeah, uh, uh, having a different language, having a different people from everywhere, covering everywhere, covering every language, covering. Uh, Different programs, this is improving uh, uh, the DHRS more and more and more. That makes sense. You can keep that, it's fine. Uh, yes. Sir. Yeah. And uh, what? So sometimes you can't find and uh, a lot of software that you're looking for. It's open source, but in the reality. But if we are talking about which is cool, so.
here and open the for, for example. Well, I think those important things consider DHIS2 and the community as a real uh, as a real open source. So for me, it's not having access to the code is the important, but maybe all these things, yes, to, together as a bundle to be considered as open source and a digital public good. That was very helpful. Uh, and, and this is something that we are addressing in our research also. What is the difference between open source and in the notional sense of it versus the real sense of it, right? What does it really mean to be open source in a way that it allows your platform for uptake among different contacts and people and so on. Having said that, this is just question one of three questions we have to pick your brain. Uh, I will quickly move to question three because I think, uh, you know, I'm switching up the order, taking liberty and so on. But uh, having said that, question three, uh, uh, yeah, question three is, how do you discover social champions? So DHIS, we all know the story, uh, was implemented for a very, very, you know, specific use case in post-appetite Africa in the early 90s. But now you see DHI is being used. As you mentioned, you want to use it across the Arab world. Uh, it is being instantiated in over 100 countries. How's, and we also understand that some of this has been demand driven, right? But how did we, how did you discover that demand? Uh, and, and why is there that demand? Who are the people who decided, okay, DHIS has worked for health, let's experiment with education. Who are the people who decided this is when, you know, we can start experimenting with DHIS? Those are the people we think are the social champions for it. You mentioned there's a broader social value to platforms like DHIS, which is why we're calling them social champions as well. Uh, so um, any personal anecdotes about how your own journey to to DHIS has been. Have you been a personal champion uh, for DHIS? Any reflections? Okay, you wanna go, you wanna go? You haven't spoken at all. You must also know what to do before you jump in. Yeah, hi, I'm Saurabh. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, I already told my desert when I introduced myself. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think it it took uh, uh, some years of experience to kind of uh, kind of say kind of self qualify myself as a DHIS two champion. So I think me and Pamod, it's been like twelve years now uh, working on DHIS two. So now you have that confidence that if someone reaches out to you. Uh, the, you can suggest the right ways to do uh, things within the software and even not looking at technical uh, areas only, but looking at the implementation principles as well. Um, but then that knowledge uh, has come from uh, when you got your own hands dirty, doing implementations, building systems, talking to the community, of course, because users are the only source of uh, information for us in terms of what they want. Uh, and uh, And that comes to us in terms of their requirements, their uh, challenges, their problems, and then we try to resolve them. So I think each implementation has brought its own learnings. Uh, so I think when you work with the network, uh, you know that uh, you have reached a certain level, then of course the onus is on us to build the future generations. So that's why I think uh, the capacity building plays a very key role when you talk about the HIST network, that we can't keep things only to us and not disseminate them. So uh, we hire interns, we hire uh, younger minds to, to learn the same things that we learned, but then in much less time, because when we started, we didn't have uh, these online courses, the documentations, we, we all relied on some old manuals to look at stuff. But then now we see that the, as the things have advanced, uh, the younger people coming in have much more resource material uh, for quickly learning the aspects, which we took a lot of time to learn uh, just by doing stuff because we didn't have any examples to look up to. So I think that has really helped that uh, 
uh, one is your own knowledge plus uh, how you can disseminate what you've learned in a much faster turnaround time to the new people that you're bringing in the uh, ecosystem uh, that will help you to kind of build more champions in a much smaller time uh, time frame as it took with us so i think when people join his india we tell them that when we joined no one was there to guide us we were just sent to implementations read the manual do stuff but here we are to mentor you to guide you so take that opportunity and and learn as fast as possible and i think uh, haneem abdul rahman these are all products of the whole ecosystem that worked with his groups worked with the ministries learned up and now they are leading implementations on their own so i think it's a continuous cycle you learn something you disseminate through workshops trainings uh, courses and then you have more people uh, kind of reaching your same level that you have and then they can so it's like a chain reaction uh, so i think that really helps in building these social champions yeah um, before I just pass it on to you, there was a question, however, in the chat online, which is, how do you, how do we define social champions? Very simply, we see social champions as people who are key in disseminating a platform. So, in the context of DHIS two, we see them as people who help uh, bring it up with their national authorities, saying, "Hey, there's this platform that we can use for not." only for health, but also for education, but also people who in some ways try to, uh, uh, you know, grow the community, right? Uh, the people who helm networks or who are the starting point for a DHIS value chain in a country, those we see as uh, social champions. And why we are interested, and I'm sorry, I'm a very bad researcher, I should have told you, why we are interested in the question of social champions is because while DHIS is a general purpose solution that solves for education health, there are also DPGs in general can be general purpose solutions for different things. And what we have in terms of, say, the Beckin protocol, uh, uh, a collective we work with, is now they try to solve for urban mobility. Now they also try to solve for e-commerce. So Amazon's a big bad brother. Let's have an Indian uh, version of Amazon. But they want to be able to use the protocol to solve more than just e-commerce and urban mobility. How do they find social champions for that? In the case of the urban mobility, it was a retired government official who was very, very annoyed with the state of affairs in Bangalore about uber being so expensive so he said let me go to the tuk tuk drivers union and speak to them about whether they want to create their own app which will not have any commissions and that's how the urban mobility solution came about but he's just one retired official we need several more inspired and i'm not sure fully retired but more inspired people to be able to do these things right and uh somebody yesterday uh in the use case bazaar told me how um someone who worked in the health department moved from there to the agriculture department and he realized that the South African agricultural data tracking system is a nightmare and he was just like we need to do something about it and hi I have a solution let's use DHIS and now they have something called APSA or Ap APSA was the yeah yeah APSA and they're building a whole agricultural data tracking analytics platform on the DHIS uh you know, code base. And that to me, even though he is in position, someone in the middle level is still a key social champion because he communicated the value of the platform, right, in that context. So yeah, this is how we describe social champions. But having said that, I will hand it over. I think I'm basically going to repeat your last point. And I think um, the, the question was around how things move from health to other areas, I think at the moment is possibly a bit of a happy accident rather than strategic. And that might impact going forward in that I don't know whether in DHS2, uh, you know, there is a kind of like strategic, let's do um, another sector next. Um, you know, 25 years ago when I was researching in health, you, you were in health, you weren't in a cross-sector world, whereas a lot of academic research models have changed from you know specific you might do cross-sector it's the topic that you're researching not necessarily the area and that might impact on that kind of DHS2 being used in other sectors and it, it might be because 
a person moves into that sector, it might be because an organization used to work exclusively in health and then moves into another field, branches out into social inclusion or gender-based violence, and they take their DHS2 skills with them, or they recruit someone with those skills. And so it's, and, and maybe that's a, there's something about the difference between a strategic targeting an area versus the happy accident. And sometimes the happy accident works best. You know, if you try and target an area in a kind of strategic business sense, sometimes it doesn't work because you're bringing what you think is required versus what is required. The happy accident is when someone sees the need and uses, you know, their skills to fill the need rather than, well, you have to do it this way. And I think from a kind of end user point of view, one of the things that we find most challenging is when we're given, when this we're told the solution because that's what people know. So if you work in an organization that is predominantly Microsoft, all the solutions have to come from the Microsoft suite of solutions, even if it's not the rest solu best solution because your organization's signed up to it. So of course, that's what the IT team will recommend. And that, that sort of fixed view versus, you know, what's the best solution is, is kind of a bit of a challenge. And sometimes it, maybe it's, I don't know, in, in commercial organizations, sometimes it's, it's harder because you're constrained by those rules, whereas you might not necessarily be in an academic research point of view. So, um, yeah, two things. I will answer your question on social champions, but I mean, the thing is this, right? So, you know, we are talking about social champions, but there is always a gap we have to bridge. So one quality of DHS2 as a platform, it's modular plus, plus most importantly, customizable. We may have modular platforms, which is not customizable, meaning you always have a gap between the developer and the actual people who are using it. Actual people who are using it can be the end users as well as people who are implementing. So the thing is like what DHS2 has been so good at, uh, comparing a couple of DPGs I have worked with is like to make things more digestible to simple people, right? Not the techie people. So that's why like when you when when you listen to someone presenting on DHS2 or like you just uh, happen to go to say uh, a COVID vaccination and you have a look at the system, you are able to comprehend what it is and can relate, right? Because these people who make these decisions are administrators or I mean like they are, none of them are techie people. That's the thing. So DHS2 has been so good at, I mean like I can tell you two examples like we'll take from Sri Lanka. How did we introduce DHS2 for EMIS or education? There were two things. So, um, yes, by accident, I would say like accident plus strategic in that way, because like we opted to engage with academia. We opted to engage. Why? So uh, we happen to be uh, teaching and le doing lectures on uh, on a on an information systems management program, where we happen to have uh, students from different different sectors in the government, right? So. DHS2 was part of this course. I mean, not to kind of teach them, but like just to show them that there's a software like this. And they kind of picked it up from there and started applying it to whatever their routine work. So that was one application of DHS2. I mean, like that, I mean, these are the kind of accidents, but like that's that's why like so engaging with academia, like we, we talk about like um introducing good things in schools for kids, because like if we want to do a change, make a change couple of uh, like decades down the line, we have to introduce at that level, disseminate. So that's one. And coming back to social uh, yeah. champions, quite coincidentally, uh, I mean, we have a big academic conference in information systems happening parallelly somewhere down south of Norway in Christiansen. So uh, me and one of my colleagues uh, presented a paper yesterday and it was about this from a more uh, technical perspective, like looking at using academic theory. So we were trying, so there is this theory called institutional theory, which is widely used in many domains. So in information systems, uh, we were trying to focus, look at these DHS2 implementations using this concept called institutional entrepreneurship. So this is basically your social champion. So what we tried to look, I mean, we analyzed some scenarios and we found out you had individuals, you had 
a collective of individuals. For example, from Sri Lanka's uh, perspective, uh, the director from the ministry, he was talking about this uh, set of people called uh, health informaticians. Yeah. They were some medical doctors who did a master's program. So they were acting as a collective during the pandemic in implementing the solution that they that they introduced at national level. So it's a national level introduction and they implement it. And then we also figured out, like for example, talking about DHS and DIVOC uh, and MOSIP, like you had government institutes acting as champions. So I would say like social, um, I mean, it is not necessarily the society. It could be even organizations, institutes. Yeah. It doesn't have to be individuals either. Exactly. So we, of course, have some academic backing. It's not published or anything, but like published as in presented, but uh, you won't find any papers, but we are planning to write a paper on that. And there's also an interesting... Uh, oh, yeah, please. Uh, there's also an... Inst like, another thing we're doing is looking and reading this book called The Entrepreneurial State. So... Oh, I have it. <laughs> oh my god we all read the same thing yeah yeah so uh yeah the entrepreneurial state is interesting because she's looking at how digitization is also changing how governments do their work of being a government and uh and uh in some ways it borrows from uh startup nation theories and so on and so forth but uh one of the things they mention is institutional entrepreneurship uh in that uh, having said that, we'll just go to the person online quickly and then Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, that's great. Uh, well, it's good to see you guys. And uh, I'm actually really happy about the, the conversation that you're having. And uh, I thought I would just jump in with, uh, with some of the thoughts that I have, and uh, especially the idea of, of discovering uh, Champions. I think it's well, this question is directly related to the question before it, which is a community communities of practice. And uh, I think uh, while you're having these conversations, I'm also rem remembering Scott's words um, when he was talking about developing apps for the analytics uh, for analytics or for DHS in general. He emphasized on the point where he said. Uh, we're only like developing when there is a real need to uh, these features, a, a real use case. And I think that really touches the subject of what we're talking about because social champions will have that at heart. They will know when there is a need, right? They will know that when there is, uh, when there is something that, uh, that will contribute to the public good. And, uh, and I, I've seen this from, from the community of practice. Well, um, I have not introduced myself, but uh, in the community practice, as community practice, I've been the community practice coordinator for about, uh, this is the third year. And uh, I've seen that it's it, having that sort of environment where it's an open public forum, uh, accessible to everyone. There is this equality. There is this uh, uh, for everyone to share, to contribute, right? And also the contributions are highlighted. So one question that I could ask, and it's uh, it actually I would start before asking this question is I would say the phrase you know what you saw. So if we really uh, I like that the word uh, happy accidents. If we really solving happy accidents, that's what we're going to get. Uh, but but if do we have the environment for social champions to contribute? Uh, another idea was uh, okay so. Really great. We have experts. They're building software and they're contributing, or they they have they have the uh, instant implementations. But is that an uh, experience being documented? Uh, do we have the knowledge? So, for example, in the practice, uh, people are sharing their their stories. They're sharing the challenges. They're sharing the solutions to the challenges, and we have that sort of live documentation that is not just a. Uh, couple of the documents that are stored online, but things that has this interaction, things, things that allow uh, knowledge sharing and builds this, builds the community. And uh, this sort of relations actually like has the environment, a social champion to make use of, to uh, present their ideas and support the, with, with further progress. And I think 
this has been very, very uh, evident in, in these ties to real life experiences where uh, just um, the, 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 the so many different uh, cases and uh, implementations across the globe. And I, I believe that's because there is enough environment or there's a proper environment for social champions to contribute and make use of, of uh, all that's available. And uh, one important thing is, uh, is that this builds these values across and it can transmit from generation to generation. It doesn't stop somewhere. It keeps growing. And um, uh, so, for example, it started way back in uh, that South, uh, in South uh, Africa and, and it got from country to country. And uh, now it's 2023 and we're still growing and, and the country uh, from people from all around the world. Uh, so I, I think, I don't know if I, if I touched the, uh, so many general terms, uh, but I think, uh, uh, you know, that's how I, I really relate with everything that you guys, that you said in the conversation. So, uh, that's why I'm also really, really happy to, uh, pinpoint some of these things that I mentioned. Um, of course, if you have any questions from uh, from, from what I said, I'm willing to go further and talk. <laughs> yes, he mentioned you are the. Pamu just added that you are the DHI two community of practice coordinator. I'm just wondering why you came in so late. But having said that, everything what you said resonated with us, and we have duly made note made note of it in our little mirror. Which, by the way, we want to make a community resource. So if anybody's interested in, um, you know, getting a copy of this, we'll be happy to just note down your email at the end of this and send it to you all because uh, all of our research is public and we will definitely uh, share it with you. But having said that, we had an intervention. Uh, uh, okay. uh, I'm not sure how much time we have, but uh, I'll just add one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll just want to reflect a little bit about the, the happy accident thing. Uh, you know, when you look at the, the countries using DHS2, Norway is on there. Uh, and they weren't weren't that uh, before COVID-19. Uh, the reason why Norway is using DHS2 is because of one lady <laughs> in uh, the northern parts of Norway uh, who did a really incredible job of, of uh, you know, introducing DHS2 for contact tracing in Norway. And I just want to, you know, uh, be a little bit critical uh, or, uh, you know, try to, to, to look at this on uh, another way. Uh, one thing is that we can say yeah, it's a happy accident that she sort of found DHS2 and, you know, started working on implementing that and, you know, disseminating and all sort of stuff. But what she did was actually, you know, doing a really good work of trying to understand all the different systems similar to DHS2. So it wasn't necessarily sort of a happy accident, but actually sort of a part of an analytical process which she conducted, where she compared all the traits of the system and tried to understand how uh, which one can best, you know, fit the um, the very changing context of the, of uh, COVID nineteen, and she chose DHS two because uh, because of the customizability. Uh, because it's free, they could bypass all the procurement processes and, and so on. And it's, you know, very interesting. So maybe it was just because the system was really good at what it was supposed to do in that context. So maybe it wasn't an, an accident. Maybe it was a very actually you know, intentional. Uh, intentional thing. Uh, yeah. And then I, I really just want to say, <laughs> yeah, I really just want to say one more thing, and that is. Um, uh, and that is, uh, you know, uh, what uh, you just mentioned on Zoom, uh, having an environment for uh, uh, for contribution. Uh, there's a, uh, this philosopher called McIntyre. He has uh, looked into what is virtue, and uh, and what he says is that, uh, you know, you're not virtuous first and then you act. It's action first and then the virtue comes with action. And I think, uh, you know, uh, how do we facilitate for social champions? How do we facilitate for sharing? How do we facilitate all, all this good stuff? We have to, you know, make 
environments, make interfaces, places where virtuous actions can be, you know, materialized. <laughs> You have to enable the actions, and uh, that, that, and I think that's a very you know key thing in uh, about DPGs. Uh, yeah, I'm going to let you speak for one minute because I, <laughs> I, have, I have two questions. So that's this. So one is a statement, other one is a question. So what he mentioned. So this is where the community has to be there, not just as a principal implementer. The localization. Yeah. The same way you approach countries sometimes in Africa and Asia, the same method doesn't work probably in some other con context yeah. like Norway. That's one. Like so, to do this localization, you need to have a community and not a principal um, like organization. The question I have is, like, okay, you build this community. Uh, do you have any thoughts about the governance of the community? Right. So, I mean, you can have a very big like, see, hundred plus countries. You ask everyone to join. Okay, how does the community works? The governance. That's a question I have. Uh, so this is something that we ask a lot of uh, DPG builders. This right? Are you comfortable with having a community? Because what is it to say someone takes your DHIS and decides to use it for broad things, right? Or or that like your backend protocol is today now being used for urban mobility solutions, but tomorrow maybe they want to use it for drug sales. What do you know, right? And and this is what uh, Sujit Nair, who is the, and I don't want to misquote him or anything, but I will tell you what he told us, uh, which is think of the community as a forest and not a walled garden, right? And in a forest, you have big, beautiful, luscious trees and you do have weeds. And, and then the forest has a way of weeding out the weeds. The forest has a way of letting trees grow tall despite the existence of certain weeds. And he says he wants DPG communities. I mean, I know it has its own problems and forests are dying, climate change and so on. Having said that, but it is still an admirable uh, analogy to keep in mind in that while a DHIS or a Beckin can facilitate thousand beautiful use cases, it still far outweighs the one bad thing that a DPG uh, can do. And which is why there is value in seeing it as general purpose solutions. I completely agree with you, which is my critique to the DPA definition as well. And in a walled garden, you regulate who has access to your protocol. You regulate who has access to your software. Then the, perhaps DHIS2 will have been implemented only in 50 countries so far, as opposed to the 107 where it finds resonance, right? And it's precisely that analogy which makes sense to me in this context, which is the governance is something that evolves over time. And there is, I mean, there needs to be some basic requirements, a sort of readiness uh, assessment, I guess, that needs to go in place before you decide to take this up. Uh, for instance, I think Primero shouldn't be implemented in countries that doesn't have, and this is my personal opinion, of course, that doesn't have a data protection or data privacy law, right? If you're dealing with sensitive gender-based violence data, the least you can do is guarantee privacy as a right to your citizens. And uh, I don't think it should be, but it has been anyway, right? So having those basic minimum requirements in place, building institutional capacity, right, alongside technical solutions is also important. Having said that, I know my colleague hasn't had a chance to say anything throughout. I was just wondering if you have uh, I'd just to like add. to jump in on the question that you asked from all. Uh, uh, so, you know, we just had like a roundtable workshop before coming for the conference and there was Beckin in the room and of course, Iga. And we did ask them that, uh, you know, like, how do you want to look at community governance? And what came across apart from what Saujanya mentioned is that why do we have to even govern in the sense we want the community to decide how they want to be governed. So the question of governance when we were thinking about it and I would say you know, uh, when we started off the research about two months back, we were also very, we were grappling with this question of governance and we were like, how do we like deal with this? Like, do we have like a core set of people who will put down rules and regulations and all of that? And during the course of our research, we realized that I think at the end of the day, the purpose of the community is that you have so many people and 
the way the community will evolve soon you will have so many people that you you know it it will just be there'll be a time where you can't manage it and that's all right and it's fine for the community to decide how they want to be governed so i think that in itself talks about how uh, a community works which is you know collaboration and having people to participate so there can't be any uh, you can't have gatekeepers to the community so the question of governance how we like to think about it in this aspect is very similar to the fact that uh, you know when it comes to code code of conduct and things like that yeah you can have like a baseline documentation of you know like ethics and all of that but beyond that i think you need to let the community flow and grow and you can't gatekeep it and allow the community to decide for themselves anybody has any questions for us we're in the yeah. last 4 minutes of our <laughs> workshop and i must admit even though this was small this was a lot uh more valuable uh than what we even set out to achieve uh we've had lovely i think it was personally very lovely to be able to speak so freely about uh questions that some of us in this space like grapple with on a daily basis uh there's sometimes nights when i just sit up reading and not finding answers as a researcher but uh there's also been reassuring to learn of how each of your experience in working with dhis and around dhis is so diverse but uh one of my professors said this in uh in college which is creativity is a noble failure so we might have failed 100 times in trying to experiment with a platform like dhis we might have failed 100 times in answering our research questions but i think it's still so valuable so long as we're able to say why we failed and how we failed so that people after us don't fail which is i think the dhis story itself while one country is still learning how to implement there are 500 other organizations and people and things that can help you do that and uh thank you so much uh if anybody is interested in this uh mero boat situation please uh do drop your email i will pass on my book and uh you will get it sometime early next week when my colleague and i back in at our desks <laughs> any questions anybody okay thank you, thank you.